So next up, we have Melissa Fennekin. So Melissa was able to fly down here and join us today after doing lots of other traveling, but she's a senior behavioral and social scientist at RAND Corporation. She's also the director for Consortium Res Resilient Gulf Communities. That's thank you. Thank you, Missy. And thank you for the honor of uh, participating in this virtual conference. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love hearing other people speak, uh, not so much myself because I come from an academic perspective, but I know some of you are very interested in uh, what the research says about why on earth do people do what they do in times of emergency. Uh, but my focus is also more on uh, what can we do ahead of disasters and what can we do after disasters uh, to help us communicate better across many different stakeholders. Um, about risk, especially when the information is uncertain. So I think that, that uh, Ryan and Amir did a great job uh, giving the justification of the um, uh, the rationale for why this is important, so I don't have to go through it so much. Uh, their real world experience is exactly uh, what we're talking about. Um, this field of risk perception and risk communication uh, research started about 40 years ago because of the real world observation that there was often a disconnect between uh, the technocrats, if you will, and the regulators, and even the scientists on one hand, and real world people, fishers, people working in tourism, elected officials, local communities, uh, talking past each other. You know, these folks, you know, I put myself in this science category, um, <coughs> collect data, they do it in a very robust way. They have a culture about how science is development how information uh, that's useful can be generated and um, shared. But that's very different from how local people might develop their own understanding and expertise about the local environment. Um, often these folks would be saying they don't know what they're talking about because they don't know what's important. Their values are different from ours. So how do we bridge that gap and get these groups understanding what they both bring to the table? and what's important information to share. Um, so when we're talking about oil so mostly I've focused on climate change uh, over the last 10, 15 years of my work. And I think it was Ryan, I uh, like Chandler Vance, who was also talking about the differences in those experiences, where we're all very familiar, and actually I should say that I grew up in the northwest of Australia where we get a lot of cyclones. Um, so that's a known risk, something that we know what to do ahead of time, how to um, prepare and be safe. Uh, I also spent 12 years in the Pacific Islands, so living in Hawaii, but traveling around, working around very low-level, low-lying islands and atoll areas. Um, so they have you know, developed many, many years or generations of knowledge about how you get ready and respond to those risks. Oil spills, not so much. But it's, it's more than that, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into what the difference is between those two types of environmental risk. But in oil spills, um, at least before an oil spill, there's different priorities in communities. For the most part, they're economic and health priorities. How do we get an income to provide for our families, have shelter? How do we keep ourselves and our families safe so that um, you know, we can function and have a way of life that we want, but we can also provide for a, a good, healthy future for our children and grandchildren. Uh, and so oil spills are not necessarily up there with something that people really want to deal with unless it's happening at the time. There's also no regulation and often a lack of funding for community engagement and community communication around these kinds of things. So that also doesn't uh, make this a priority. There's a lack of trust in government, uh, and I, you know, I think this has increased over the years uh, and the industry. Uh, it varies a lot depending on the issue you're talking about, uh, but that doesn't help us uh, set the scene for good communications. When we're actually in an oil spill, things are changing. The two previous speakers talked a lot about the uncertainty uh, and confusing information, but it's partly because we don't know what's going to happen. It's impossible to say, oh, things are going to be fine, or oh, this is what the impact is, what the impact is going to be because it depends on the weather, it depends on ocean conditions, uh, and these things are unpredictable. You know, scientists have a lot of great models, and especially over the last 10 years, the research has really improved our fate and transport and, uh, and high uh, atmospheric conditions and how it all interacts. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all probabilistic. So we don't have 100% certainty, and it's hard to communicate uh, about uncertainty, especially when emotions are higher. Uh, it's a complex information landscape, not only because of the uncertainty, but the nature of information. There's uh, you know, physical science, there's biological and environmental factors to consider, there's human health, physical health, there's emotional health, there's stress, there's economic issues, uh, and it all has to go into a hopper way. Now we also have social media uh, and many sources of information uh, that may seem more or less trustworthy and may be more or less trustworthy. Uh, this lack of cultural interoperability, often we think about that in terms of different uh, agencies trying to talk to each other or different disciplines. But I also think that you know, scientists and community people, we just have different norms and rules of you know, ways that we talk about information. Uh, and it's hard to, to understand and, and trust each other when we haven't set the groundwork for that understanding. Uh, and you know, I said there's this ubiquity of misinformation or misrepresentation of information, uh, particularly with the rise of social media and access to information, but not necessarily a whole lot of media literacy that's going with that so that people are not making informed judgments about the source of the information or having some way of understanding how, how to determine whether the information they're receiving uh, is in fact good information. <coughs> So how do people make decisions under conditions of risk? Uh, well, if you think about it, we literally make hundreds of decisions every day about risk and uncertainty. Uh, what medicines to take, what transport to take to work, uh, whether we'll let our kids play a stream that might be polluted, whether we should choose to live in a house that's near uh, a chemical plant, or should we live out in a, in a more rural area where perhaps there are less services available. But somehow we navigate all this uncertainty uh, pretty successfully for the most part. Uh, but sometimes we do make spectacular mistakes. Um, so the question is, why do we do what we do when we do it? How do we perceive risk? And how do we respond to those perceptions, which are really important because as you know, people, whether you're a scientist, an expert or something, a lay, a lay person, at some point you have to step outside of your field of expertise and have to figure out what you're going to do. Uh, so just from a practical perspective, uh, I think this is where the rationale is clearly laid out uh, by Ryan and the mayor, that we need to understand different perspectives, in part because if we can articulate different views and values, that will help us facilitate the necessary debates and communications that have to happen before an oil spill, during an oil spill, and after an oil spill. And certainly kudos to Gomery and uh, the National Academy's Research Program for funding uh, Sea Grant throughout this process of the last few years, but especially now to really interact with diverse stakeholders which are all represented in this room, um, to really think through what are the list of projects and things that we still need, how, what are the processes and procedures and relationships uh, that we should be working on. So hopefully this will improve decision processes and outcomes, and I have this grand goal, goal of reducing global conflict, but I think it's, it's not that grand in that if we can have a better understanding of the different perspectives and values that are coming to the table and in this society figure out how to listen to and integrate those different parties and know that they can change depending on the situation, maybe there will be a little bit more trust in the way that uh, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, basically just says that when we make a decision, it depends on all the things that we bring to the table as a decision maker. But it also depends on the nature of the information we're getting and the context in which we're using that information. I should say that I'm a psychologist by training, so all these uh, cognitive and social and emotional processes are really uh, interesting to me. Uh, but it boils down to, I think, you know um, that things are complex, but we can figure it out as we move along. Um, the question is why. So this is one a, a study that was done when the field was first established many years ago. They observed that, uh, so I'll tell you the task is that people were told that motor vehicles kill 50,000 people a year in the US, and then people were asked to give an estimate of the mortality rate for each of about 40 other hazardous activities and technologies. And what they found was a systematic misestimation where People overestimated the risk of things like botulism, or dying from a tornado, or dying from a flood, or pregnancy. So at the same time, people tended to misestimate 
in the sense that they underestimated the risk of dying from things like asthma or diabetes. And so over the years, we've come to understand that one of the reasons for the systematic misestimation is that things on the left there are very dramatic causes of death. We can get a vivid image in our head as to um, you know, how someone might die from a tornado, and it's not pretty. Whereas we know actually a lot of people that are walking around with diabetes and asthma. So it seems like it's more common or more familiar. Uh, and um, so it therefore seems less risky to people. Uh, a lot of research has basically come down to the understanding that perceptions of risk are determined or, or driven by two main factors, the what we call bipolar. So the uh, x-axis here, uh, sorry, the y-axis here is uh, unknown risk, so that's the extent to which something is observable, familiar, well-known to people within your control. Uh, and the dread uh, factor there is the extent to which something uh, is unknown, unobservable, or um, might be a threat to future generations, has a risk of actually dying from it. Uh, things that are um, involuntary also, and I forget who it was that mentioned uh, that part of the equation. But if, if you take the example of, uh, you know, if I paint your house and woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning and said, uh, you know, get in the car, uh, and I took you up a high mountain, and uh, this is in the middle of winter, and I strapped sticks to your feet and push it downhill, you would say, that is terribly risky. But uh, if we said, let's go skiing in the winter in Appalachia, let's just go have some fun this weekend, and you did it yourself, and you voluntarily got in that car, and you said, okay, I'll put these pieces of wood on my feet, and I will take myself down that hill. It would seem a lot more fun. Hopefully, uh, you see the, the point of the story there is that when someone else is forcing into if there's an oil spill uh, or even a, an act of nature um, that happens to you, it's seen as more risky than if you choose to do it yourself. When you add in the difference between a hurricane that is seen as more natural versus some technological disaster like an oil spill, uh, where someone is seen to be in control or to blame for that problem, uh, or that uh, event that happens, uh, then we have very different reactions and perceptions of the risk, and so we have different responses about what should be done, what should have been done, and what should be done now in the future. How much time do I have? Because I know you're running late. Yes, I know. Oh, okay. All right. So I'm just kind of skipping through a few different interesting findings um, in the hope that uh, some of this will be of interest to you. Uh, one of the very interesting findings that I spent a lot of my career working on is the fact that men typically judge risk and judge the risk of different hazardous activities as is lower than women. And there have been a lot of different theories or hypotheses uh, suggested for this. Um, but it's been hard to separate out uh, differences uh, by gender and by race uh, because of very co varying factors such as you know, trusting government, um, worldviews, and some other. Uh, issues that I'll describe in just a moment. But here's the key finding that, so let me step back a second. One of the uh, hypotheses that people proposed originally was that maybe gender differences occur because of some kind of irrationality or ineducability. So at the time, the theory was that, well, perhaps women are less rational or um, not as well educated about risk and risk assessment processes as men. So that's why they have a higher perception of risk. But we did a study with UK and Canadian toxicologists, all of whom are highly trained. So PhDs in how do you assess risk? What is their risk analysis process? Uh, and we asked them to rate uh, just on a four-point scale from no risk to very risky, um, all these different items. And you can see what we call a tornado graph, that there is the difference between female versus male ratings of risk. Uh, for pretty much all the items is to the right of percent mark. So given that all these people are highly educated about risk specifically, uh, that kind of uh, eroded that explanation. But another explanation given was more based in a biological um, hypothesis, and that is, well, women are programmed to nature and maintain life with this birth. Girls are physically more vulnerable uh, to violence, such as rape or other violence. Um, so perhaps it's something to do with just our genetics, our biology. 
Uh, but in a, a study where we only sampled minority groups, we were able to see that the line on the left uh, is white males, we have <coughs> white females, more white males, and more white females. And pretty much across almost all of the hazards we have asked people to rate again on that four point scale, white males tended to have lower risk perceptions on average than the other three groups, the uh, white females, some white males, and more white females. And so this again eroded that biology explanation because you would expect gender differences to transcend racial differences. Uh, I'm sorry, you expect racial differences to transcend no, gender differences to transcend racial differences in that um, you would expect the male-female difference to occur regardless of whether you're white or not, uh, which is clearly not what we found here. Long story short, what we started exploring were differences in worldviews, uh, differences in trust in government, uh, regulatory agencies, uh, and so on, and ways of making decisions that people uh, thought were good or bad or um, that it should be pursued as you know, in a democracy like ours. To start off with the worldviews, what we found was that it was actually not about race and gender. It's just people with lower risk perceptions. In our society, that tends to be white males. Um, but people with lower risk perceptions tend to agree with more hierarchical statements. So that, uh, for instance, if you said um, uh, risk should be imposed on individuals without their consent uh, if it's deemed in the interest of society, they would agree with that. They would disagree with egalitarian statements such as you know, risks and benefits should be spread across um, the whole of society. They would also disagree with community based decision making. Um, at the end of the day, what we see is that there's a lot of variability in perceptions of race, but also in the socio political values within race and gender groups. And what it comes down to is the extent to which you or a group that you belong to is more vulnerable, is less in control, uh, and may perhaps benefit less. So if you're someone who is creating the risk, managing the risk, able to uh, maintain or sustain some benefit from that risk, uh, then you probably will see it as less risky than others who are not in that, those positions, more powerful or controlling positions. Uh, a good example is in uh, Sweden, we never find that gender difference. The male and female risk perceptions are very similar across a whole bunch of items. And some suggest that it's because it's a much more egalitarian society up here. And uh, women are approximately half of the uh, various decision making bodies elected and one elected. Um, so I'll leave you with that just as uh, different ways that people like these social psychologists and others can look at. Why do people think differently about risk? But what, what is the implication of that? Uh, at the end of the day, it might not matter why, it's just the fact that we come to these challenges uh, and these uncertain situations with different understandings of how the world works, we don't like we want the world to work. Uh, how do we um, move ahead and make sure that the right information is getting to the right hands at the right time and then decisions are being made in the right way? Um, well, firstly, of course, we just have to acknowledge that different worldviews matter. But we can go further. So an example is, uh, if we look at people who tend towards uh, adopting hierarchical worldviews, they prefer expert groups making the decisions. So they would be more likely to say, okay, this is outside my area of expertise. I want someone who's an expert in this, who knows all the technical um, information that they need to know, to be making decisions for me. So that it's a bit more of that top-down hierarchical decision-making process. Egalitarians, on the other hand, come to this saying, well, I think all the information should be provided to everyone so that we can all make our own decisions in the marketplace. So to some extent or another, everyone wants to be involved in the decision-making process in different ways depending on the situation. But ultimately, I think the, the challenge is where people are willing to trust some processes in people more than others. So an example is um, if you provide me with information about food labels, and food labels for instance, uh, I actually think that people are okay with some, I mean, sorry, I just like this one. Um, they're okay with some types of decisions, but not others. So uh, 
questions about whether a food or some product should be on the market uh, is really, in both, from both an egalitarian and a hierarchical perspective, uh, informed by the relevant stakeholders. So this is the hierarchical people, it's the um, experts, or the uh, egalitarian people, it's more the, um, the uh, different people who are going to consume those kinds of options not to. When we go into the uh, type of decisions that are more ethical in nature, whether that thing should be on the, on the market at all, I think that's where people really differ uh, about what uh, who should be making what decisions. So let me wrap up with just a couple of other uh, nuggets of information that we've got from all this research. Um, I think that one of the, the themes underlying all these different findings is that it, does, it, it matters, the quality of information definitely matters. The way that it's translated or packaged definitely matters. And Cigarette does a fantastic job in really bridging that science or expert to layperson um, knowledge gap. But there's more than that. And it doesn't, you could continue to improve the communication and the content of that information more and more and more. But uh, and, and there's other things going on here. One of the things that I think is really important that the mayor and Ryan did on um, so clearly was that place is important. The reason being that uh, we are connected to our place. Even if you're someone that's traveled around and moved around, there's still some kind of um, relationship that you have with the experience of the place that you are and the place that you feel you belong to. Um, I'm going to try and skip over a few things to uh, make this a little quicker for Missy. Um, one of the things about place uh, from air pollution research at least, is that visual experiences are very important. So when you see something like soot landing on your windowsill or like the, um, the decontamination vessels there, or actually you had some great photos, Ryan, about the nets that show that pollution from the oil and you didn't even know you couldn't say what was in there but it was brown it was beautiful but it was foreign uh, so those kinds of experiences are very important and it comes from that knowledge and, and deep connection with uh, place i think that's highly related to trust people have talked about trust um, and probably yesterday also a lot so i'm going to skip over that one but again it's those experiential pieces of information that we are paying attention so we have the science on one hand, we have the experiences, whether they're visual or they're from emotional feelings of trusting someone. What on earth are we to do? From a psychological perspective, what we know is that people process information, no matter who you are, using two different systems. There's the analytic system, which is that's the logic side, that's where we're very deliberative, we take time, we like to collect all the information that we can possibly look at in the context that we have. But we also have this experiential system, which is a much more rapid, sometimes intuitive or um, automatic process. Uh, and it's based on those experiences. And that's why when there's this lack of understanding between the scientists and regulators and play people, it's because we're bringing, we're using different systems. But it doesn't mean that the other side is not using both systems at the same time. Ultimately, we need both types of uh, information processing systems. If you think about going back to all those decisions we make every day, if you have to cross a road and you would to sit there and think, oh, okay, so the velocity of the oncoming vehicle is probably this. If I cross at this time, the impact and the consequences of the impact, you would never cross a road. You would get stuck in analysis paralysis. And that's why we have this experiential system. Everybody has it. It's not. It, it's actually an older system, psychologically speaking. Um, and at the same time, we need the analysis. One of the unique things about being human is that, wow, look what we can do with the way that we have figured out um, different technologies and, and other scientific pursuits. To figure out how to move forward, what to pursue and what to avoid, we need both systems to interact. Uh, 
I just explain some narrative, uh, but I think narrative is a really good way to try and integrate the system. Talking to people in this kind of venue, talking to people in town halls, having focus groups or community meetings where people can really bring to the table, I'm really worried about this. Why are you worried about that? Because I worry that my kids are going to get poisoned, or I worry that I'm not going to be able to pay bills. Those kinds of issues can come up uh, more freely in some context than in more lecture style um, environments. So I think a diverse array of uh, communication contexts are really important. So, anyway, uh, the Sea Grant Gomery Partnership, where we gave a, a shout out to because I think they've been fabulous. Of course, there's a lot of academic research that's produced a lot of papers and reports. Um, I think that local governments and non government organizations have been terrific in. Uh, participating in forums like this and in many other research programs to help communicate that information and get more informed and help share. It could be about the claims process or it could be about the safety and safety, uh, but they'd be terrific. I just wish there was more funding uh, for those kinds of efforts. Uh, and then, of course, there's many different forums in which uh, we've heard about the lessons learned. Uh, just to wrap up and say public engagement uh, is critical. For all the reasons that everyone, you know, real people like Ryan and the mayor um, talk about community groups, the um, BPSOS and other uh, terrific groups have shared. Um, but I still think there are some other dress concerns. I think dispersants is one of them. Uh, and I think that the uh, situation specific information um, that evolves very rapidly during a spill, but even after the spill, is Populations change and science and knowledge changes uh, means that we have to be vigilant and continue to um, talk and share information. Um, I think that we have this fantastic opportunity to be prepared better ahead of the next. Um, it might be an oil spill, but it might be something else. A different technology comes along that we haven't even dreamed of yet. Um, but getting people's attention without overburdening or burning them out is really. A tricky balance. Uh, and then there's this great report by uh, Anne Hayward Walker and some other recommendations also, which I can share with you if you are interested. I would say I've covered pretty much all of these things. I think the, uh, if there was one thing from all of this information that I would really emphasize, it's the grounding our efforts in local context. And that means involving local people in all stages of preparing, responding, and recovering from a disaster. And then just because I'm a geeky uh, scientist, I think that the only way we can learn from our efforts is to really systematically evaluate and know whether and how things would work and then just have a free tool and, and um, uh, tailor our next efforts and try and uh, collect that information so that we know whether it's uh, this is our consortium which is there. Um, so thank you very much for your attention.